Jag har gjort en ibis i det stora. En ibis i det. No, no business today. Okay, good. Um, we don't have any new members as such, although uh, we have a new member who um, uh, the Vice President will introduce uh, a bit later on at the new members' corners. Um, any, any birthdays? Any birthdays? No birthdays. Today or tomorrow? Reg. Today or tomorrow? Reg. When? Whenever. Whenever? 17th of April. 17th of April, Brian McNair. 84. 84. 84. Fantastic. I'm younger every day. Reg Jackson. Reg Jackson. Reg Jackson. Reg Jackson. When was your birthday, Reg? Saturday. Saturday. How many? How many? No. Tell him. Tell him. He knows. Who's that? We're not going to believe you anyway. I've got five to go. I can't see. Who All right. Um, five to go to get Who is the guy speaking? Oh, Reg. There's confusion at the front. I didn't hear that. What was that? 95. 95. Jeez, good, good for 95. Good for 95. Um, I'll invite the Vice President to do the roll call. If you would, thanks, Mick. Okay. Uh, Rob Adams? Yes. Leader Bedford. Noel Benton. Bird Barron. Yes. Bruce Bazant. Yes. Hector Davis. Michael Dowdy. Uh, apology. John Dowdy. Yep. 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 Len Edwards. Yes. Robert Urbacker. Yeah. Alan Evans. Present. Brian Fitt, I'm here. Bob Frenchman, apology. apology. Noel Griffith, apology. Stuart Hall, Frank Henny, present. Bob Hill, apology, apology for Bob. Deadly Feast, yes. John Horsfall, apology. Rich Jackson, yeah. David Lang. David, just told you you'll be here for lunch. You'll be here for lunch, yep. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Jerry Mazzoletti. Brian McMahon. Present. John Nettow. Apology from Gary Nervo. Apology. Gary Papworth here. I'm here, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Graham Ratton. Yep. <coughs> Ryan? Yes. Will Semler? Well, no. <laughs> Colin Stiles? Yep. David Taylor? Yep. Les Thurley? Yep. Keith Tupper? Present. Vivio Churisek? Yes. Andy Walsh is here. Thank you. Ian Williamson? Uh, apology for Ian. I think you missed one. John? John Perry. John Perry Jones. John Perry Jones. Yeah. You missed a couple, you missed me. I know I'm insignificant. <laughs> and Joe. 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 Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Now, um, invite our Secretary Colin Colin Stiles to give us a uh, give us an update. If you're able to, Colin. I'm not much. The book club did have a meeting. It was most successful. Um, it's looking for new members. We've got a couple of new ones. Um, it was fantastic. Uh, also went to the bank with uh, Bert. And we confused them dramatically. So there you are. Finance is in good control. Oh, well done. Who's control of the bank? <laughs> now, my money man, Mr. Burt. Sorry? Looks like you're rolling in it this morning. Oh, we'll how's this, how's the, the health of our finances? We've got um, $267 in the bank and 139 in petty cash. And can you confirm that you did um, confuse the bank officials? And oh, we did the other day. We were wanting to draw out two hundred and seventy-four thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> did you hear about that one? No. You can tell us all if you like. <laughs> now, there was a guy in front of uh, of um, Bruce and I, 
at the bank and uh, <laughs> wouldn't, move, wouldn't move from the cashier and uh, he wanted to draw out everything. He had been in trouble in America with cash and he wanted to do all his 274000 out of the Commonwealth Bank. Wow. They finished up with a couple of cops to come in and escort him out. Mm. Apparently he could have got, he had to, they had to give, uh, he'd get it the next day, he had to give 24 hours notice. It was a bit of a drama though. I was going to say, he didn't have a couple of pistols on him, did he? <laughs> all right. Um, ordinarily we'd have David Lunds report as Elmer, but um, he's, uh, he's, he's been unwell, but Graham? Yep. Yeah, David spoke to me yesterday. Two people he wanted to mention. One was uh, Bob Hill, who, yep. uh, as you know, had a minor stroke. Um, he's uh, in um, rehab at the Repap, and he's doing okay. I spoke to Bob yesterday, and he's walking around with a walker thing uh, with a bit of help. So he's uh, on the mend. He, he's optimistic about getting to the uh, 40th anniversary lunch. Yep. The other person is John Horsfall. Yep. Who's uh, he's um, in a uh, uh, in respite in a place in Camberwell at the moment, and he's happy there. Okay, all right. Not not sure how long he'll be there, Grant. No. no, no. Okay, no. all right. That's that's good. Thank you for that update. And David is getting better from his knee laceration. Fantastic. No, that's good news. Getting it dressed on Monday. Every Monday he gets it dressed at home. Okay. He's out playing croquet all day. Terrific. Yeah, well, it'll be good to see him at lunchtime today, for sure. Um, uh, Mr. Patworth, anything happening in the uh, external activity world? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> Thank you, kind sir. Good morning, everybody. How are we today? Can you hear me okay? It's echoing a little bit in the distance there. Um, Wednesday the 22nd of March was the combined barbecue at, up at Springbrook Village. Uh, this is the first time for so many years that we've been able to hold one because of COVID and everything else. There's a total of 64 people there, which was fantastic in attendance. I'm sure everyone had a great day. And I'd like, on behalf of the three clubs, I would like to thank the guys from my club who helped in the barbecue. Great, uh, fa fantastic guys, I really, really appreciate it, the three of you, really great. Um, Saturday, April the 29th, yeah, good idea, good idea. <coughs> For those that were there, it was really great. Saturday, April the 29th, we're off on a trip to Sydney in the Blue Mountains for eight days. Uh, I'm sure there'll be info on its way very shortly in regards to pick up and the time up for those that are going. Tuesday, May the 9th, is Heidelberg Provost Club's 40th anniversary lunch, being held at St George's Church, Warrenfoot Cliff Road, East Ivanhoe, at 11am. Uh, cost being $55 and must be paid today, or you will not be counted into the catering for the function, because we have to pay the caterer and so forth and so on. And I'll be away, and Graham will be away as well, so please pay the money today if you haven't paid and you want to go. Uh, please have the money in an envelope with a function, a name and a number going on the front. Thank you. Uh, Tuesday, June the 27th, there's been a little bit of a hiccup with the addresses and also the dates. I made a mistake with the dates and I think Bruce had it switched around a different way, didn't you, on the addresses, I think, if I remember rightly. And he did send an email about it anyway. But Tuesday, June the 27th, is lunch at the Watsonia RSL. 6 Morwell Avenue, Watsonia, at 12.30 p.m. They've got the list up there now. You can start putting your names on it, okay? Um, I've got something for July and August. Uh, and just to mention, we won't be here for lunch in May, uh, but the list for the lunch in June is up there. Would you please put your names on it? Because it'll be hopeless trying to put names on when we have our luncheon down at the church, okay? Um, also, please note the dates and addresses of the newsletter were wrong. I've already told you that bit. Okay, I'll leave you with this little thing here. This is a doctor in Dublin. A doctor in Dublin wanted to get off work for the day, so he approached his assistant and told him, Murphy, I am going fishing tomorrow and don't want to close the clinic. I want you to take care of the clinic and take care of all my patients. Yes, sir, answered Murphy. The doctor goes fishing and returns the following day and asks, so Murphy, how was your day? Murphy told him that it took care of three patients. 
Uh, the first one had a headache, so I, he did so. I gave him pam paracetamol. Bravo, Murthy lad. And the second one, asked the doctor, the second one had indigestion, and I gave him ga Gaviston. So I si did, sir, says Murphy. Bravo, bravo, you're good at this. And what about the third one, asked the doctor. Sir, I was sitting here and suddenly the door flies open and a young, gorgeous woman burst in, so in, like a bolt out of the blue. She tears off her clothing, taking off everything, including her bra and her knickers, and lies down on the table, spreading her legs and shouts, help me, for the love of St. Patrick, I've been, I have not seen a man in five years. Jesus, Murphy, what did you do, asked the doctor. I put drops in her eyes and said, sent her to Specsavers. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Don't forget the money up there in an envelope. <laughs> oh, <okay, sir. laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Um, just before we introduce uh, members... Um, get Mick to introduce members' corners, I'll just uh, remind everybody that there is a copy of the historical salute to the club, the 40-year um, book, if you like. It's um, available down the back there where our, our guest speaker and um, her friends have gathered. But um, it's there, so if you'd like a copy today um, and want to order a copy today, you've got it there. Mr Secretary, thanks very much. Here it is. There it is. There it is. It's a magnificent... I've read it from cover to cover, it's fantastic. There you go. There you are. You can take it on board for that. I might even take it to the book club. There you yeah, go, yeah, Cobb. Yeah. How's that? I'm very good book. All right. Uh, Mr Vice President, I'll call on you to introduce our uh, Members Corner. Here also, good morning everyone. Good morning, Mick. Good morning, um, I'm still sort of getting now all the names, so um, I don't know a lot about uh, our person in Members' Corner today, but uh, Dr Joe Landsberg is one of our newest members. Um, so Joe, yeah, we'd invite you up here and tell us your story. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, out of hearing, I wasn't quite sure you were calling me up. <laughs> right. Bruce, do you want me to wear that? looks as though there's already one here. Um, Gentlemen, thank you. Um, <laughs> my apologies for being a bit all over the place this morning. We were away for Easter and for a few days before, and I didn't see the email, and Colin sent me an email and said, you're going to do Members' Corner on Tuesday. And my wife was going off to Israel this evening, so I was running around and doing stuff for her, and she fortunately met David in, in church, and he said, is Joe down at Probus, coming down to Probus? And she said, no, he is now. So <laughs> anyway, this is Members' Corner, and I believe the normal procedure is to give an idea of your life and interests and so on, and I'm very happy to do that. I'm a bit sorry about the short notice in my terms because I didn't. I would have had lots of pretty pictures because I was bought, born and brought up in Africa. And so I can show you pictures of interesting wild animals and interesting places. But uh, we'll have to forego those. Colin says he's dobbed me in for other sorts of talks later on because of my professional background. So you'll get the pictures. Right now, I will just give you a run through of my rather eclectic life and end up and see if we can end up with uh, somewhere interesting and I'm very happy to be interrupted to ask questions on, on the fly or later. As I said, I was born in Africa in Rhodesia, as it then was, um, and I grew up there and went to boarding school there. And later on by a set of curious chances because I wasn't very bright and there was no university in Rhodesia. I ended up going to university in South Africa and got myself a degree in agriculture, went back to Rhodesia and worked there. Now about that time, which was the mid-60s, the African national movements were really beginning to feel their oats and were beginning to feel that perhaps 
they ought to be running this country and not this quarter of a million white people. So we had this huge disparity, classic colonial system. Quarter of a million white people, we had a very fine lifestyle. We made a nice country. It had a transport system that worked, communications, law, education, everything, and we thought that was fine. The African people, of whom there were four million at that time, there are now 20, um, didn't get most of those privileges and they didn't run the place. So they started agitating. Well, the agitation had been going on for a while, but it was quite clear that it was going, there was going to be violence, and indeed there was. It so happened that I got offered a job in South Africa, mm. and I always felt a bit bad about that because there was a thing called the chicken run. And those who saw the violence coming and left because they were afraid were, went on the chicken run. I always maintain I didn't go on the chicken run, I went because I had been offered a job. And it so happened that a short while later, well, I left at the time of the, of the um, oh, what do you call it, when you vote, <laughs> election, which brought a fellow called Ian Smith to power. And Ian Smith was a hard-wing, right-inclined person politically, and he had the, the slogan that the whites would be there for the foreseeable future, hundreds of years. He was way wrong, but he was a very stubborn man, um, and he set about trying to make that a fact of life. So from about the mid-60s, about the time we left Rhodesia, what they called the Bush War started, and the Bush War was an ugly little guerrilla war which went on for 11 years. I had done my national service, and if I hadn't happened to go to South Africa, I would have had to fight in it, and maybe I wouldn't be here now, because a lot of guys were killed, or well, quite a lot anyway. Um, anyway, we went to South Africa, and I was pursuing a career in research, and I got interested in science, and I knew that I wasn't going to make a, a, a career in science by staying in the middle of Africa. We went to South Africa, and I worked there for a few years. We produced a few kids, and then by lots of discussion and um, quite a lot of luck, I got offered a postgraduate fellowship in the UK in Aberdeen, of all places. Why Aberdeen? Well, it's a long story, and I won't give you, bore you with it, but I didn't even know where Aberdeen was. <laughs> and what I didn't realise was the culture shock that was in store for us. Because put my wife and my four, our four little kids, well, my wife has always been enormously supportive. We put our four little kids on a big boat called the, the Edinburgh Castle, which went from Durban to Cape Town to the Canary Islands to Britain. And uh, that was the first time we'd ever been out of Africa. Uh, we landed up in Britain and we rented a little car and chugged our way up the UK to Aberdeen, and Aberdeen is on the northwest coast, northeast coast, as I'm sure you know. And we arrived there in the middle of summer, Aberdeen summer. We had just left African winter, and we thought that Aberdeen summer came out really poorly in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very cold place, yeah. and it's very, it can be very tedious because you get up one morning occasionally, not very often, and you'd see the sun shining, and you think, yes, sunshine. So out you'd go, and without your sweater, and you'd go somewhere, and then in would roll the North Sea mist, which the Scots, for some reason, called the Har, H-A-A-R. And so you could have, from mid to late morning, you'd be covered in mist and greyness, and that was how Aberdeen was. However, we managed with considerable difficulty. Uh, the other thing was that hit you, Dalings, if you, I lived all my life in the tropics, and I, I knew, oh, you know, dalings change, you know, the, the earth turns on its axis and all this good stuff. Well, we went to Aberdeen and we found that in the middle of summer, the sun comes up at some stupid time, like half past three or four in the morning, if it comes up, but it gets light anyway. Uh, and then it doesn't get dark until round about half past 10, 11 at night. And it's completely discombobulating. 
particularly if you've got small kids who have no idea and who are photoperiodic. They're driven by light. So, <laughs> so we had, it was quite difficult sometimes, and we had very little money, so um, it was one of those things which you, those periods which are great for your life experience and great when they're over. So we spent three years in Aberdeen, and then I got offered a job in England to run a research group, my first sort of job as a relatively senior job, and I ran a little research group which had six or eight guys in it, and women, people. Um, and we were in the west of England, near Bristol, for 10 years from that time on, during which we spent a year in Western Australia. One of the things about being a scientist, if, you, if you're any good, and I guess I have to say I'm quite a good scientist, uh, you don't make much money, but you can get to see a lot of the world on other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an example. I was invited to Western Australia, to the university there, to spend a year as a lecturer because somebody else was on leave. So off we went on the University of Western Australia's money and uh, spent our first year in Australia. We put our kids, who were getting a little bigger then, into a big old Falcon station wagon, which boiled if you went more than about 100 k's for any length of time. But during the vacation, we drove from Perth across the Nullarbor to Port Augusta, and then we drove through New South Wales, visiting various places, and drove up to Sydney, got on a plane, went to New Zealand to visit more scientists, came back, went to Brisbane, drove the car back to Port Augusta and put it on the train and we sat there and who was telling us a story about the GAN? It was, it was Bruce, you didn't go, it was on the, uh, the Canadian Pacific, not the GAN, isn't it? Anyway, the train. Indian Pacific. Indian Pacific. <laughs> hmm? Indian Pacific. Indian Pacific, not, I'm on the wrong continent. <laughs> <laughs> Indian Pacific. Anyway, that was great. I still remember that. We relaxed for two or three days. The kids had a fine time. Train, at you get back to Perth, get your car off the train and off you go. So, moving on very quickly, 10 years in the UK, um, lots of visits to conferences and things like that resulted. And I was in Sydney on another of these fellowships. I, I held a fellowship which I always treasure because of the pretentious name. It was the Lawrence William Paulet Scholarship. And I got this for three months. It funded travel and living. And I went, arrived in Sydney and I went to the department head and said, OK, I have this senior scholarship. What do you want me to do? He said, go away and be a scholar. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is you give some lectures and you help some graduate students and so on. And while I was there, I was interviewed by CSIRO for the position of chief of the Division of Forest Research. Now, again, I can't, uh, too many details in the background, but I had worked on tree physiology and the interactions between trees and their environment in various parts of my career, mainly in Scotland, but also in England to some extent. So I was interviewed by CSIRO for this job about which I didn't know very much, but they appointed me to the horror of many people in the organization, and they went, where the hell did they get this guy? He's not an Australian, he's not a forester, um, and we, they're gonna put him in charge of this very large research group, 200 people spread all over Australia, the biggest research, forest research group in the country. So I had my moments with the forest industries because they thought I was a raving greenie. Delete raving, and then I'll confess to greenie. <laughs> I am green in the conventional modern sense. I'm a conservationist. And I was concerned with how we managed forests as ecosystems and um, all the interesting, there's wonderfully interesting stuff to do in the research in that area. And recognizing also that Australia has a decent forest industry, sometimes, um, and so you have a lot of plantation forestry, so both those streams are important. But um, the forest 
people, the people who ran forestry, these were all guys who used to have hard hats and chainsaws and, and they thought that forestry is a business. And if you're running a plantation forestry as a cropping system, you're correct. But if you're trying to look at forests all over Australia, it's not just a business. It's about a huge ecosystems which are very important to this country in all sorts of ways and more important than just um, how much timber you can get out of them. But the, uh, <laughs> the State Forest Service guys didn't like me much because I didn't go their way and I used to go to these heavy-duty national management meetings and say, well, you know, we should do it this way, we should do that. And they, I think in all the years I was in CSIRO, the prevailing, uh, <laughs> the prevailing response to me was probably, why don't they, where, where did they get this guy and why doesn't he go away? <laughs> but I went away eventually, but I would claim that I did a pretty good job because the, forest, the Division of Forest Research did a lot of good work in the years I was there. There are still um, things that I can point to now, 30 years later, which we did well, which made the difference. Um, but anyway, my term came to an end. And one thing that CSIRO has never been good at was, um, is, tell me, am I going too long? Uh, <laughs> is what to do with ex-senior people. Because I'd been in a very senior position representing the organization both here and overseas. And then I retired. Well, I wasn't retired, my contract ended. But I had a letter which said I was contracted, I had a job until I was 65. And at that stage I was 50 something. So I went to the chief executive of CSIRO and said, what do you want me to do, Keith? And he said, I don't know, you've got to go find something to do, which was fine. I got located in another division and um, did research in, this, in the Alice Springs area, actually, which doesn't have much to do with forestry. But I had a background which, as a general ecologist and in agriculture, allowed me to do something useful there. Then I got another, oh yeah, I was appointed as the the Director for Natural Resources Management for the Murray-Darling Basin Commission. And the Murray-Darling Basin Commission, as I'm sure you're well aware, is a very political yeah, operation. Absolutely. Even more now than it was then. I'm not going to go there now because it was very interesting. I learned a lot. I think whether I did a decent job or not is another matter. But the Murray-Darling Basin is one of the more interesting river systems in the world. It's very long. People, we talk about the Great Murray. In fact, it's really a piddling little river. Um, but it's the best we have. And the management of the Murray-Darling Basin, the basin as a whole, as a land management operation, is vital to this country, and it's not being managed well. Um, and you will, those who follow these things in the press, realize that there are constant arguments about who owns how much water and how much the states can take out and whether all those grasping characters up in northern New South Wales or southern Queensland are going to pull everything out of the river before it gets down and so on and so forth. So that was interesting. But I got offered another peculiar job uh, with NASA, as in the National um, Aeronautical and... NASA, sorry. National... <laughs> what's, what's the yes? Space, 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 space. National Aeronautic and Space Administration, which again was a bit of a surprise, but there was a very big project they were running where they were looking at the interaction between forests and the atmosphere based on research sites in Canada. And uh, NASA was using, NASA has wondrous amounts of gear. Um, so they used everything from low-flying light aircraft, we didn't have drones at that stage, that was in the 90s, um, to higher flying aircraft to space, um, measurements from space to look at what's happening on the forests on the ground, and then you had teams on the ground measuring how the trees were behaving, and the whole trick of the business is to tie it all together. You really need to understand how ecosystems 
in this case forests, so boreal forests, work in relation to climate. So that was very interesting and I was in America for a couple of years, but I'll tell you what, if you are ever offered, I think it's a bit late for most of you, but um, <laughs> if you're ever offered a, uh, an appointment in Washington, make damn sure you know where you're going to live and that you have enough contacts. But I found Washington, which was where I was based, to be unfriendly and lonely. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was a, a very considerably interesting experience and I came back and then spent the last years of my career in at the bench in CSIRO. So I've just run you through 40 years of my career and I haven't finished yet. <laughs> um, towards the end of, my, of that time, I did what I really liked doing, which was I did some theoretical work on the interaction between forests and atmosphere and developed a, th a model, a mathematical model which allowed us to predict, allows us to predict how fast forests will grow under given climate types, what they will, what will, <coughs> how they will respond to anything from drought to not floods, um, to various management action and so on. And, and this was a model which I wrote and with a friend and published and it was fun. I really enjoyed doing that. And um, to my immense surprise and gratification, uh, 20 years later, I received one of these um, wonderful phone calls that you read about. It was evening and we were in the Blue Mountains where we were living and the phone went and it was a lousy line and I'm as deaf as a post. And I picked up the thing and there's some guy going, bah, 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 and I couldn't hear what he was saying. And so I wanted to call my wife who was in a shower. Said, Diana, there's someone on the phone and I need to find out what it's about. So she came with her towel wrapped around her, which wasn't necessary because there was only me there. Uh, <laughs> um, and she talked and talked and talked and, and I thought, oh, she's being scammed. She's a sucker for being scammed. But yes, 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 yes. yes. And then I heard her giving out my email. And I was like, no, 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 you, you can't. What are you doing? You can't do that. And she said, <laughs> anyway, the phone call was from Sweden. And I had won a thing called the Wallenberg Prize, which is the equivalent in forest science of the Nobel Prize. Um, so that was... <laughs> thank you. And if I had remembered, I would bring the certificates. And so it also comes with a, with a nice check. Um, and the, actually just recently, because of COVID, we flew over to Stockholm, met the king and queen, had this monstrous reception, and we had a lot of fun for a week or so. And that put a satisfactory end to that, and that's probably a reasonable point to bring an end to my little talk, and I'm sorry it was so disorganized. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, you want that? Thanks, Joe. That was, that was amazing. <laughs> so we really appreciated you sharing. Do you want me to take some questions or time? Oh, sorry, yes. Absolutely. Does anybody want questions? You may have to translate because I don't know what's here. Okay. Okay, don't bother. You can grab me later. Are you still doing any work? Joe? You still working? No, I stopped. Uh, right. About three or four years ago. Okay. Uh, I really enjoyed the post retirement, so called, years because. As I said, one of the things about being a very decent scientist is you get to see a lot of the world and other people's money. And then, um, in the years in, from between 2003 and about 2012, I went to Brazil twice, Chile, Estonia, Sweden twice, and South Africa to teach at postgraduate workshops. Again, on someone else's money. and. Um, but that was the end of the time. I, okay. I wrote a book, which is on my bookshelf, yep. and there are several actually, and um, now I don't do so. No, it's it's great. Great. Thank, Thank you. Right up the back there. Hang on, Jack. Oh, yep. Yep. Can I just ask a basic question? Um, big tree, we've got a big oak tree in our front yep. garden, yep. about 40 or 50 yep. feet high. 
and without water, of course. No. And yet, it surprises me how, with uh, water, I imagine, it yeah. gets up to the yeah. top. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a very good technical question, which is the question is how does water basically get to the top of a big tree? And you might think it's quite dry and the soil is quite dry, but the tree's okay. It's capillary action. If you look at the structure of wood, it consists of lots of fine capillaries and they're not continuous. You can't sustain capillary action over, let's say, 30 meters, but you can sustain it over short periods and, then, and these vessels are linked to each other, often very depending on the tree type, with little side gates as it were, so that you don't get cavitation, because if you break the columns, the water doesn't rise. But basically the process is sun shines on the leaves and water goes out, because all, all plant leaves have things called stomata, Whoops, I better hold on, I'm getting a little carried away here. Um, <laughs> Stomachs are a tiny little pores on the leaves and the water comes out of those all the time. That's what keeps plants alive and that's why they pull water out of the soil. But to keep the leaves supplied with water, you've got to move it up the system and you have this conducting system and it works to up to 100 meters. It's amazing. Uh, and we, you, your, your question is sort of rather the main point because over most of my career and still now people have been figuring out exactly how the system works, how things hold together, what happens if you cut this. You can do unkind experiments by cutting half the tree and watching that and what happens. So yeah, it's capillary action and it's a good, good robust process despite how fragile it seems. So will there be a deep tap root going down to a, an underground water stream? Or? No, it doesn't have to. Uh, if you dig up a tree, which you, I'm sure you, it's got a mass of fine roots, particularly in the top meters or so, meter or so, and if you really get down to it, those fine roots are in what we call intimate contact with the soil particles. They permeate the soil, and water can move from the soil to the roots. So as water is sucked out of the tree system, it's sucked into the roots. The whole thing is to do with suction gradients, and most of the tree's water will come from the top meter. It's not big tap roots. Thanks, Joe. We've all learned a lot today about um, uh, the areas you've been uh, involved with and, and you, so yeah, well done. Look, um, we appreciated hearing your insights on an amazing career. Um, in a quickly changing world. We had to adapt to vastly different cultures, cultures just being how we do things around here, making a very valuable contribution in all your various roles. So uh, if you put your hands together for Joe Roll. Well, Uh, ordinarily, we have some songs today led by uh, Rich and uh, Noel Griffiths, but Noel's not here today, so um, uh, you got that off the hook today, fellas. Um, shortly, um, Mick will introduce our guest speaker, uh, Bronwyn Kearney. Bronwyn's here with, uh, with her mates and such down the back. Hi, Bronwyn. Um, we'll just have a short interlude. I think uh, Colin's helped getting things set up for Bron, so. Um, we just have a chat amongst yourselves for a minute until we get ready. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah
Oh, yeah, yeah, bring that down, yeah. 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 It's easy to the way. I've got another one. I've got a second one. Yeah. He's easier with the way, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Put the other USB is I think so, yeah. <laughs> Give him a drink. Uh -huh. Nice to meet you. All right, not a worry. Thank you. Yes, yes, so I did get asked about that outside, yeah. <laughs> Big wagon to another. <laughs> So it's a, uh, yeah, that's it. And it's uh, this one here, Christmas. I did it for eight years, and I would say, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, because this is, um, it's pretty boring with our few visuals on it. Yeah, it has got the dreams, hasn't it? A little, little bit. Yeah, that's good. Can everyone hear our speaker when you're going to do a test of speech? Can you hear me? If you show up, you might hear her. Can you hear me up the back? You can't hear me up the back? Yes, oh look, thank you. We need, we've got a set from the back. Excellent. Can you hear me up the back? Can you hear me down the front? So what is your need to speak up? Okay, if we could um, just have everyone's attention. Um, I'd like to introduce Bronwyn Keenan. Uh, Bronwyn grew up in Montmorency, moved to the bush, New South Wales and Victoria as a meat inspector, then come back um, after a career change and become a paramedic. So we're looking forward to hearing your journey. Welcome, Bronwyn. Thanks very much. Thanks for that. Uh, good morning, as you heard, my name's Bronwyn. Uh, I'm a paramedic in my 20th year with Ambulance Victoria. Before I continue, of course, there's a disclaimer. I'm not here actually um, under the auspices of AV, but um, the opinions expressed are my own and not those of Ambulance Victoria. Um, also, there's a couple of descriptive photos there, so I hope it doesn't put you off your lunch, but they're not too bad. I want to take you through the process of calling triple zero when to call triple zero, and mostly what happens during treatment and transport with Ambulance Victoria. Also, what if it's not an emergency? What do you do if you're worried about yourself or someone else? 
A call to triple zero usually starts with a person needing medical assistance or intervention. Generally, the most serious medical presentations are chest pain, stroke, heart attack, bleeding or cardiac arrest. Certainly, car accidents, falls and many other forms of trauma are reasons to call triple zero. There's lots of reasons to call triple zero and really calling triple zero is up to the individual. Some people will call for a stub toe. No. It's true. An annoying eyelash. <laughs> oh, God. They can't sleep. Or well, they're woken by a loud noise. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. These jobs have been dispatched to ambulance. Everyone's idea of needing an ambulance is different. I recall as a student listening to a recording of a woman who called triple zero screaming, my boy, my boy, he's been hit by a car. My boy, she kept saying. Of course, her boy was a cat. But we're a caring society and this woman would have had an ambulance dispatched to her. So you dial triple zero and it's actually Telstra who answer the call and ask police, fire or ambulance. Seems to take a bit long for some people, but this is the process. You request whom you need, and in this presentation, you ask for an ambulance. You put through to the emergency services call centre known as Esther in Burwood. A call taker asks your name and address and what's your emergency. You'll also be asked many other questions about the patient like, are they breathing normally? Are they responding to you? And do they have pain? Your call is triaged depending on your emergency. The call taker will direct you to administer first aid or other assessments or CPR if necessary. From the time the call taker gets your address and main problem, an ambulance is selected by computer. Call takers have 90 seconds to gain answers to prescribed questions according to the dispatch grid. So yes, an ambulance is already on its way. These days there are other avenues of dealing with non-emergency situations. The situations that don't require an ambulance are redirected to what is known as the referral service, and this is through triple zero. It's called the referral service or REVCOM, where callers are given further, further help with their situation. So matter the reason, no matter what the reason is for your call, you'll be triaged to someone who can help you. So an ambulance is dispatched to you. We can get to you via an ambulance, not that one, a motorbike, a push bike, a plane, a four wheel drive, or the good old chopper. And no, you don't get to choose. We should arrive within 13 minutes for the most serious of situations. On arrival at scene, wherever that may be, hopefully you'll feel better just for seeing us. We'll ask you what's happening. And while you tell us, we'll be placing on uh, our monitoring equipment on you. We'll perform certain assessments and hopefully come to a conclusion as to what's going on. Our equipment is not diagnostic. It's just a guide. We'll do ECG, blood pressure, oxygen sets, blood sugar, and listen to what you have to tell us. We'll have IV access and be administering drugs to treat you before leaving your home. After assessing you and treating you, we're usually on the way to hospital within 20 minutes of arrival to you. Our key performance indicators are 13 minutes to get to you on a code one and uh, less than 20 minutes on scene. If you're having an acute myocardial infarction, also known as an AMI or heart attack, we can send a copy of the ECG to the hospital via Bluetooth. If it's chest pain with no signs of myocardial infarction, will have you feeling better and pain-free before arrival at hospital. Symptoms can differ greatly between men and women. Males tend to display chest pain with or without neck, face and arm pain, shortness of breath and sweating. Women seem to present with less common symptoms. Certainly short, shortness of breath, but pain-wise, it's wrist or arm pain. The only way to confirm if you've had a heart attack or an AMI is a blood test. We don't do blood tests in the ambulance, so you need to go to hospital for that. Chest pain can also mean the onset of cardiac arrest. A cardiac arrest is when your heart stops. Statistics wise, 75% of cardiac arrests occur at home. This can present as chest pain, shortness of breath and sweating. 
you might display all of these symptoms or just one symptom, or a person may just collapse. Of all cardiac arrests in 2018-19, 67% were male, 33% were female. And as I said, 75% occur at home. Again, it's important you call triple zero if you have any unusual symptoms. In instances of stroke, it's possible to have a CT scan outside the front of your home. A purpose-built truck can perform CT scans on scene. You're probably familiar with the FAST test. FAST stands for face, arms, speech and time. If you're showing positive signs of stroke, the truck can be there to do a, 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 on scene uh, to do a CT scan and be, begin treatment. So what's happening to your heart and brain during these episodes? As you can see, this is a slide. Uh, the picture on the left is a, is a um, uh, an, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, um, <laughs> this is a this is a um, like an unhealthy brain, I suppose. This is a, a brain with a, a blocked uh, blood vessel, and as you can see, the the um, the vessels that perfuse the brain have been blocked, uh, or it can be caused by a bleed. Um, you can see the area that's been starved of oxygen. Carbon dioxide and other waste products build up in the cells and because of the blockage, the blood vessels and the tissue begin to die. So what you see is speech and balance problems, vomiting, one-sided weakness, confusion or an unconscious person. A heart attack or an AMI has similar, similar pathophysiology except it occurs in the heart. On the left is a healthy, well-perfused heart with good blood flow to the heart muscle. On the right is a heart where part of the muscle tissue has died because of a blockage in the vessel. That's the, the whitest patch there. This is what's happening to the heart. What you see or experience is chest pain, sweating, nausea, arm pain, all, some or only one symptom. Many patients I've taken to hospital having an AMI or heart attack have been taken immediately to the cath lab for stents, a process that opens up the blocked artery of the heart. Usually the cardiologist finds occlusion in excess of 92%. It's amazing how we can still function with such a degree of blockage. So time is of the essence because that directly impacts on your outcome. If you find yourself thinking, should I call an ambulance? Yes, you should. You should call triple zero. No doubt you've all probably heard information about heart attacks and strokes aside from what I've told you today. But what about the less life-threatening situations, the situations that put people in a position where they think to themselves, should I call an ambulance or not? Lingering coughs and colds, fevers, urinary tract infections, falls, or just someone who's been sick for a couple of days and is not improving. Kids who are off colour, lethargic, generally unwell. What do you do then? I know it's difficult to make GP appointments these days. I've found it can take up to a month, according to some patients. There's also VED and nurse on call. <coughs> Excuse me. If you don't feel that calling triple zero is necessary, VED is, is a virtual emergency department. It's a FaceTime phone call to an emergency department doctor or nurse. A paramedic can make the call and report your vital signs and other findings to the doctor or nurse. And we do this um, quite often. They then have a chat with you and decide if you need transport to hospital with us or in your own car, or if you just need a script. You may just need a script for a minor infection. They can write the script, send it to your pharmacy, and then you go and pick it up. Virtual emergency department can be a bit convoluted with registering, but it's an excellent way to get help, so long as you have a phone with video calls. It's an excellent source of help without clogging up the hospital system. Unfortunately, this avenue of help is not <coughs> advertised a lot, but it's there for the public to use, and I've found it helpful at home and with patients, and assists with um, keeping people out of the hospital system and in their own home. And there's also a nurse on call. You're probably all more aware of that than the VED. Nurse on call is another excellent means of help. Nurse on call will even direct your call to triple zero if they deem it necessary. Great for advice, especially when it comes to children. I don't think you should worry. 
sometimes in the less serious medical presentations that people are not sure what to do. Um, I think if you're tossing up whether to call triple zero or any of the other services, I think you should call. Don't be afraid of calling. The triple zero call takers will triage your call and direct you to the most appropriate help through REVCOM. There's nurse on call and there's VED. My main message is don't worry yourself. If you're in two minds, you need to call one of these services. There's also an on-call service for mental health issues. It's called telehealth. It's for people who have a medical health crisis, uh, uh, sorry, mental health crisis. At this stage, it's for paramedic use, but it's another avenue to help people without unnecessarily taking them to hospital. So if you're worried about your own health or someone else's, don't worry for too long. If you find yourself thinking, do I call or not to call? It worked. Um, if triple zero is the only number you can recall, um, it's okay. Call triple zero. A paramedic uh, will always be there to help when you're in good hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to talk to you all. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Robert. No, that's all right. Yeah. Thanks well, very much good. for the uh, presentation. Oh, it's a Ron. pleasure. What's the most common thing that ambulances get called out for? You know, uh, look, look these days. Look back in in the old days, and it was even before I started. Of course, we did you know trauma, yeah. you know your car accidents, your broken bones, things like that. We still do that sort of stuff, but today I find we're doing more. Um, Look, there's a lot of social services. Yeah. There's a lot of jobs we we go to. And again, this this comes back to people's idea of needing an ambulance is very different. Um, and so we go to a lot of people who um, who are unsure. Um, in the in the presentation of things like chest pain or possible stroke, we'll always take people to hospital. Yeah. Um, but I find we do a lot of social work as well, a lot of mental health work. And personally, I find, yes, hospital systems are getting clogged up. Uh, um, some of that, and I don't know what percentages, are, are people with mental health issues. And unfortunately, people with mental health issues aren't suffering anything physical that needs correcting. It's up here. And so we take them to hospital and they sit in the hospital corridor and they just get bypassed to people with chest pain or kids with, you know, bump to the head. So in my opinion, I, you know, I think people should, our mental health patients should be going to a mental health hospital, not a medical hospital. So we're doing, yes, we're still doing a mix. Of, well, I can't recall the last time I went to a serious car accident, um, you know, like a trauma. Um, I've been to a few, but, but mainly it's things like chest pain, stroke symptoms, um, elderly people with UTIs or that have fallen out of bed at nursing homes and hit their head and they're on blood thinners. Um, and the mental health issues, yeah, and, and social issues. Yeah. Thank you very much, thank you. Not a worry, thank you. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> during the worst part of the COVID yeah. problem, mm. um, did you have problems with getting ambulances out to someone urgently or within a short period of time, or were there long delays depending on the type of problem? Yeah, look, um, ambulance will, um, they send out, look, it's every day we get um, text messages for, you know, for overtime, for extra services. And certainly during COVID, um, whether it was a MICA, the mobile intensive care ambulance, or whether it was a road ambulance that I work on, um, we were being sent out text messages that if you, you know, that, that we need other crews, um, similar to the fires up at um, King Lake. Mm. Um, yes, but of course, you know, the King Lake fires were for X amount of time, whereas COVID went on for two years. But yes, I, I still think we're suffering the after effects of that. Um, and I suppose what brought on a shortage of ambulances was not only the increase in calls, um, but also because um, paramedics were coming down sick um, and hospital staff were stick, sick. So the whole system, yes, was under a lot of pressure. And, um, so you would, would you prioritise heart failure, say, as a as a as a first? 
Yeah, look, it depends. Anything respiratory or cardiac it is, or, or stroke is very definitely prioritised. Yeah. Um, and cardiac people that are unconscious or, you know, not responding, we assume that they're in yeah. cardiac arrest. So, yeah, certainly all those jobs are prioritised. But it's yeah. nothing to be um, going to a code one, someone that might have cardiac failure. But if a priority zero comes through, we, if we're the closest car, we'll be redirected off that code one will be sent to the priority yeah. zero. But certainly services were pushed during COVID because a lot of people were having respiratory issues. Some were very panicked, uh, some needed to go to hospital, yeah. um, but the state government had a means of keeping people at home, registering them with the hospital, and pretty much every day the hospital would ring that person to make yeah. sure they're okay, and if there was any deterioration, they'd be put through to triple zero. And I'm thinking from my own experience yeah. in the last uh, three or four years, yeah. Uh, I've had a heart failure, which oh, yeah. got me instant yes. ambulance. Yes, it will, yes. yeah. Uh, both happening at night. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the second was a broken bone from a fall inside. Oh, yeah. Which took two and a half hours. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is right. Look, I get a bit annoyed sometimes. We can be going um, a, a, a fall, like a fractured hip, something like that, will be a code two because you're not in actual life threat. And, and it's a pain issue rather yes. than, than your heart or your lungs being... Um, but that was know. during COVID, of course, yeah. the second time. Yeah, looking, I, I think right. you could probably still wait two and a half hours with a broken bone these days. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we could be coming to you code two, but if a code one goes off, mm -hmm. we'll be redirected. Yeah. Um, and so that is where you wait. Yeah. Um, look, if you, if, if you were to get on the phone and go, yes, look, I've broken my leg, they will ask you, are you breathing okay? If you say no, then they will send you an ambulance short of breath, not send you an ambulance yeah. broken bone. Mm -hmm. yes, was, um, the second time was purely a pain thing, which wasn't yeah. just bearable. Yeah, but it's not. It's not nice. No, we've had. It we've was had. Terrible, you know, we've had elderly people. You know, but we've been going to a job of a of a hip fracture, a NOF, neck of femur, and we have been directed code one to a yeah. person that's unconscious because they've had too much to drink. <coughs> it's not fair. It's not fair. Mm, yeah. It really um, annoys me. But but that's the system. That's the yeah, grid system. Enough, yeah. yeah. Mm. So like tell them you're short of breath. And you won't find anybody here who's going to be in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I ask a question? Um, typically, how many jobs would you go to in a day? And what's mm. some of us work a, a five day week? What's what's your work, work worth? How does it, how does it look? Um, well, ours is like an eight day week. We work four on four off. So I do two ten hour days, and then I'll do two fourteen hour nights. So this week, if I start on a on when I start tomorrow, I'll work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Friday and Saturday will be my night shifts, and then I'm off uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So the following week, I go back on a Thursday. Um, so it's an eight day week. Um, how many jobs a day? Look, possibly most jobs take around two two and a half hours. It all depends. Sometimes we can leave people at home if they're okay. Um, but I suppose we would do probably four jobs a day and, and most of the time we're doing between one and two hours over time. And even after a 14 hour shift, we will still do one or two hours over time. And there's no shortage of jobs, I take it? No, there's not. No, the moment, pretty much the moment you're clear, the moment you're leaving hospital, you'll get another job. Yeah. David? Yeah, just, just two things. Um, my understanding is that the, uh, the qualification the paramedic qualification in Australia is ranked very well. In fact, I've heard that uh, the UK has been recruiting Australian yeah, that's paramedics correct. because yeah. they've got a, got a shortage. So, it's, so just your comment on that. The second one is on the mental health side. Mm -hmm. do, do you work in conjunction with the CAT teams at all as far as that situation is concerned? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. On, on scene um, and depending on the hours, usually the CAT teams only work daylight hours pretty much. Um, but quite often, if, if people are having a, a, a crisis, a mental health uh, person may be there and they'll request us. And so when we, uh, when we arrive, generally there's some... If they're, uh, if they're not voluntary, they can be sectioned under the Mental Health Act um, or they can have a revoked community treatment order. A lot of people with mental health can live out in the community and they have a, what they call a CTO, the community treatment order, which allows them to still live in the community 
but, but visit a, um, a mental health specialist. If they break that order for any reason, um, we, can, we can be called to transport these people. More often than not, they come along voluntarily because they know that they've broken their order. Um, if they don't, um, and if, they, if they're aggressive in any way these days, we can sedate them, uh, but we need police with us. Or um, if we don't, if they're not aggressive, uh, but they're not agreeing to come along with us, we still get the police because the police will section them under um, Section 351 of the Act where they can be forcibly taken to hospital. Um, but it's only if they become aggressive where, as a paramedic, we sedate them for our safety and for theirs. Mm. Oh, thanks, Brian. Your time is very valuable. Oh. I, I guess you're waiting sometimes for things to occur. You're doing stuff. But how much of your time is spent waiting in hospital? Yeah. Really mucking about? Yeah, a lot. How would you divide those times up? Uh, look, look <clears throat> on a day shift, we start at 7 o'clock in the morning. We've usually got a job pretty much straight away. We do a handover from the night shift crew, check off drugs, check the truck, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll have a job by easy by 10 past 7. Uh, we'll get to the patient at uh, 20 past 7. We'll be at hospital um, by 8 o'clock. Um, we may not get a bed until 9 or 10 o'clock in some instances, and particularly in the afternoon, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Austin or not, but um, in the ambulance entrance, there's a hallway that's, that's probably 25 or 30 metres long, and it's nothing to have both sides of that hallway um, full by midday with, with ambulances waiting, with, with stretchers, sorry, waiting. Yeah. Of the two staff, that's $160,000 or more per year. The ambulance is about half a million. You're saying that half the time that's blocked because hospitals. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. a very important point. Thank yeah. You. And look, Belette, look, this is just my point of view. Like I said, I don't have figures from Ambulance Victoria. I could be overstating it. Mm. But, you know, there are times when when you know we'll stand in the hallway uh, for two, two and a half hours. And look, we, we continue to monitor you. If you need more pain relief, we can give you that. But yes, from a financial and waiting point of view, um, we spend considerable amount of time waiting in hospital. Some days we might only do two jobs because we're waiting at hospital. Um, and if crews have been there too long and their patient's not too sick, um, uh, we will take over, when our paperwork's done for our patient, we'll take over a, another patient so that that crew can go back out and be back out on the road. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is to fix this. Personally, I think we need more doctors and nurses because when we take you to hospital, the only way you'll get out of there is if you see a doctor or a nurse. That's the only way you get out. And so we need more doctors and nurses because if, if we've got more doctors and nurses, people will be seen quicker and we get back out on the road. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, just two simple questions. How much of the cost an ambulance trip from a person's home to hospital or, uh, or on the road or whatever? I, I think the average, um, like, you know, 12, 15 kilometre journey is about twelve, fifteen hundred dollars mm. And that's if, you know, you'll also get charged if we give you penthrane or morphine. If we have to defibrillate you, I suppose, you'll get charged the cost of the pads. Um, but, yes, generally just for the transport is, is anything up to about $1,500. Um, if you're interstate, we have reciprocal rights. So if you've got ambulance membership or a pension card, and not all pensions cover ambulance, um, but it is, it's for free if, if you've got the appropriate pension card or ambulance subscription. Yeah. So people can't afford to pay? What, what happens? Uh, yeah, look, I don't know. That, I, I have heard of that happening before. That's I, I think generally um, they just let it slide. It's usually... Um, people of poor socioeconomic circumstances where they'll let it slide or for some reason they don't have a pension card. Um, but I don't know how they, you know, people that can afford it, I don't know how that's chased up. That's the billing department. But, yeah, it's not cheap. And the, the second little bit, yeah. um, what age should children, sort of, uh, sort of semi-adult children, be taught first day in CPR in the case of, say, like, one of their parents has collapsed on the floor? Yeah. What, what does the kid do? Yeah, look, I, I think they've even got CPR programs, and, and it's just strictly CPR, and all that is is this person will be unconscious on the ground, you put them on their back, and you just, just go for the middle of the chest. We don't do this, this measuring bit anymore. You just go for the middle of the chest and push. And this is what they're teaching um, kids in primary school. So I'm guessing, you know, eight, nine, and 10. And, and look, it's hard work. It's not easy. If you start CPR on anybody, um, the moment you start, you want to be saying to your mates, let's get three, four, five people lined up to take over. 
because even with us, we take a we swap every two minutes. It's hard work. Yeah. Well, they ring triple O. Yeah, they ring triple O, and and the call taker will direct. You know, Mummy's on the ground and she's not talking to me. All right, put her on her back, and and they can even direct kids to do CPR because these programs are in school to just get in the middle of the chest and just pump. That's all you do. And and look, don't um, you know, this business of breathing in the mouth and then doing CPR. You're better off just keeping on doing CPR because that action of pumping on the chest and getting the heart to pump will will it encourages um, air intake and airflow um, and my mantra is if you wouldn't kiss them don't do mouth to mouth <laughs> generally generally they don't need mouth to mouth all they need is really good constant um, nice and deep CPR fast deep CPR and that's why you need a couple of people lined up to help you it's hard work yeah Thanks. Well, Ron, look, just one last question. Yeah, sure. Over the last few years, there's been a lot of violence directed towards nursing staff, mm. and staff, particularly, mm. you know, I've read a lot of admin papers. Yeah. Can you make a comment about that? I mean, how do you keep yourself safe out of the job? Um, you go to sometimes and you don't know what you're going to deal with. You're mm. walking and... Yeah. Uh, does that happen to you and that sort of... That sort of uh, uh, look, look, I've had people get aggressive and, yeah. and um, the bottom line is if it gets too much and, and we're, being, we're taught just go off your gut instinct, yeah. um, just leave. And, uh, you know, don't worry about the bags or the drugs or anything like that, just leave. Um, some people get agitated because they've waited so long for an ambulance. Yeah. That doesn't happen very often. I think generally the public have a lot of respect for paramedics. I don't think they have as much, much respect for the police or <laughs> nurses. Yeah. Personally, I think nurses put up with more abuse than yeah. we do. Yeah. Um, and, and we're also taught de-escalation techniques. So, you know, if we're, uh, you know, mental health patients, people that have been waiting for an ambulance, people that are just angry in domestic violence situations, we keep our distance. We, um, you know, it's a matter of using a calm voice, addressing them, using their name saying to them that you understand, that you're here to listen, and generally that will bring people down. The only time I've had a, a, a swing at me was a, a poor old man who had a blood sugar of about 0 0.2, and I got too close, but I, um, he gave me a good round arm, but, you know, I was, I was quick enough to pull away. And really that's the closest I've gotten to any, any physical yeah, violence. Um, and look, sometimes it, it could be, um, you know, Alzheimer patients from a nursing home, um, it was only a couple of weeks ago I went to an old man and, and he'd had a go at the staff and when we arrived he was sitting in a chair so I sat about a metre away and I just said, look, you know, you know who I am and he's like, yes, we got along fine and, and of course, you know, but half an hour prior this man was throwing chairs and, and physically punching other people so maybe there's some protection in the uniform I mean, I never take it for granted um, but I think nurses and police officers have it far harder than we do Okay, thank you Yeah, right, not a worry yeah. yeah, could you just say something about uh, from the, about the uh, my car ambulances? How do they differ from a paramedic, and who calls them, and where are they used? Yeah, uh, well, the the MICA uh, ambulance it stands for Mobile Intensive Care Ambulance. Um, and in the case of um, our priority zeros, which is um, you know unconscious patients or patients in cardiac arrest. Um, uh, code one chest pains. Sometimes with chest pains, um, they'll just uh, send a road car. When we get there, and if we find that you're actually having a heart attack, um, an AMI, we can request mica. So the mica skills are far more advanced than a, than a road person. People like myself, um, they can give like someone that's in cardiac arrest. Um, that's where your heart stops, the road crew get there, we do our CPR, we shock you, let's say we get your, your heart beating again, then um, that process that takes us down a different pathway and Micah can give you specific drugs to treat you, to keep your heart beating, um, to keep your blood pressure up, that sort of thing. And plus they have a, um, we now have a um, mechanical um, CPR device. So generally, if we're doing CPR, Micah rock up, they will put on the um, the automatic, which is quite a brutal thing to see, uh, but they'll put on the automatic CPR machine. So their, their scope of practice and their use of drugs is far wider than a road, basically as a road crew. We can treat you for pain and shortness of breath. We can reduce the load on your heart if you're in APO. Um, uh, that sort of thing, but mica actually give you more, um, yeah, more more serious drugs to keep you going and keep or, or to sedate you if they want to tube you, 
um, out, out um, on the scene, which is a very difficult thing to do, then they will, you know, knock you out and they give you these... They're dangerous drugs. They're drugs that anaesthetists use in hospital um, with everything around them they need to help them. But, but with mica, you're out, you're in the back of a truck, you've got suction, you've got your drugs, and that's about it. Um, so, yes, they have a wider scope of practice than us. They can do more invasive techniques... Um, if we can't get a line, if we can't get IV access, um, a mica can do a, what they call an intraosseous access, where they uh, basically screw into your leg bone um, to get drugs into you. Yeah. So, whereas road crews can't do that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, Jim? Yeah. Well, uh, recently, a colleague of ours had a fall uh, with bleeding badly. An ambulance was called, <clears throat> and during the triage, who was our one? It was asked, uh, did he have Medicare card? The Medicare card number was required. Oh. Why not have this? Well, was that the triple zero call taker asked that? Yes. Oh, okay. Was it put through to REFCOM? Yeah, sometimes, you know, because when you make the call, the, the call taker, you know, are they awake? Are they talking to you? Are they breathing? You know, what's their skin colour? Um, so sometimes it, if all that gets a tick, if all that's normal, that job may go, th go through to REFCOM. Um, I don't know why they're asking for a, a Medicare um, number. Uh, sometimes when people ring, some people can understate the situation. You know, we might be going to someone that's short of breath, and when we get there, um, these people are pretty much unconscious. So it's not that they're short of breath, they're, they're having a stroke. Um, and then these people go, oh, yeah, I'm short of breath and, you know, my chest hurts. And we get there and, and they're having a, a cry because they've broken up with their boyfriend or girlfriend. So um, some people can understate. Uh, and, and, you, and your call can get put through to, um, to REFCOM, which, which takes codes three and four. Um, but if, if with discussions with the REFCOM person, that call can come back to triple zero and you'll get an ambulance. Um, but I'm not sure why they asked for the <coughs> Medicare uh, card number. Yeah, that, that's a bit bizarre. Cannot explain, sorry. Okay, great. Get any calls for overdoses of drugs? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and look, even um, some people will call themselves. Um, so you might have someone, you know, they're taking their meds during the day and, mm -hmm. and then they sit down at night with their blister pack and they're like, oh, hang on a minute. I, I took, you know tomorrow's drugs along with today's drugs, something like that. And so people will call and they go, well, yeah, look, I think I've taken an overdose. So you can have these people who have consciously but unintentionally overdosed, but you also have, um, you know, other people ringing saying, you know, my 16-year-old daughter has overdosed on, um, on her mental health drugs or, um, uh, you know, she's gotten into my medication and, and overdosed on, um, on morphine. And then there's also <coughs> your, your illicit drugs, your um, heroin um, all your other illicit drugs that people can... Because when you're buying from various buyers, you don't always get the same product. Some, some heroin is, is a higher grade than others. And when people take their usual dose, um, if, if it's of a higher grade, it will put them into cardiac arrest. So, yeah, that comes through as an, an overdose cardiac arrest, yeah, for sure. So do you snoop around the area where the patient is to see... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in, in, in instances where it's sort of, um, you know, illicit drugs, you know, it's usually in a, a, you know, a pretty awful house or in a laneway, something like that. Um, and, yeah, we'll always be on the lookout um, for sharps and needles. Usually, I must say, um, people who do take drugs, they, it'll be a friend that will call the ambulance. And when we get there, the friend will still be on scene. And we don't disclose anything to the police. We don't dob them in. We, in fact, courage. We always thank them for staying on scene, for helping us, for remaining with their friend, for calling us, um, because that's important. You know, what have they had? Have they had it with anything else? Have they had more than usual? Those questions are important. And so we're always grateful when their friend stays on scene for us to arrive, yeah. And the, these drugs were caused with a respiratory... Oh, for sure, respiratory depression. Often they'll go into <coughs> respiratory depression first and then that leads to um, cardiac arrest, yes. And, and the, the friend that, that rings and says, you know, my friend's not breathing, uh, they'll be there doing CPR when we get there. Yeah. They're, they're very, look, you know, I know it sounds odd, but they're very good to each other, um, drug users. And they're always, you know, they're not necessarily rich people. They're poor, they're down and out as they have mental health issues. 
and they take heroin or, or smoke marijuana or do what they do um, for relief. Um, there's lots of reasons. Um, but when they overdose, um, yes, their friends will call, their friends will stay, and their, their friends will give us a hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Have you got a happy story? Have you got a bird? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I think I've done about a dozen births all up, and um, probably the most hair-raising one. When you're at when you're at uh, uni, we, I studied down at Frankston, Monash in Frankston. Um, they always have a scenario where it's three o'clock in the morning, and and you know a lady's going to give birth, and it's a breach, and you know it's cold and wet and all the rest of it. And so I was working at Nunna Wadding. It would be about five or six years ago now, and. Um, we got a call for a lady about to give birth and they sent a mica unit because they were a closer car. And when we get there, this lady, uh, she's from um, Southern Asia, didn't speak any English, and she was only a small lady. And the mica guy, Kevin, was giving me a handover, gave me the obs, and he, and he said, look, you know, I don't know how far along she is. She's had some contractions. These are her obs and everything was okay. So we get her loaded in the car and we're driving along and I'm making some notes. And the next minute she grabbed my arm and she was bearing down. So I had a look and, and this baby was on its way. So I said to my partner, Rob, let's upgrade. We were heading to Box Hill Hospital. I said, let's, let's upgrade to a code one. We'll move along a bit quicker. Uh, so anyway, the, the contraction finished. Basically, the, the presenting part that was coming out had retracted, but we were still going um, signal one to hospital. And it was only about 30 seconds later, she grabbed my arm again. This, this lady through the whole episode didn't, didn't make a whimper, didn't make a noise. Anyway, um, so by this stage, the baby coming out was, was about that much. And it was just this white thing. I didn't, couldn't even know what I was looking at. Anyway, it turns out that the baby was still in the sack. And what I was looking at was um, its bottom and, and the legs were curled around. It was just this nice, neat little package. So... We ended up getting this woman on up on all fours. Her husband was there in the truck with us, and again, neither of them made a noise. Um, and the baby started coming out, and thankfully, um, the legs weren't stuck. The legs came out and broke free when the when the sack broke. And uh, when the arms came out, the arms were tucked in under it, which was good, because if the arms were out, it would have blocked on the pubic bone, and then we would have been in trouble. But the baby came out in this lovely, neat little package, and it was just hanging by its head. Uh, and it was getting bluer and bluer and of course mum doesn't understand English um, and we were waiting for this baby to finally pop out and probably after about four or five minutes it popped out it was quite blue it was um, flat um, uh, we had um, some equipment my partner had set up some oxygen equipment prior to the baby actually um, coming out we had we spoke to our clinician uh, my partner Rob said, we know we've got a breech birth here, we'll need some mica. And all I heard was, oh, that's no good. So I sort of thought, well, you know, we're on our own here. Um, so look, finally the baby popped out. It was blue. It was very limp. Um, we started with some, um, some respirations. Um, I put the baby up onto my arm uh, for stimulation. We were rubbing its back. And all I remember were these arms flicking every time I rubbed its back. So we did about, then we put it, and I mean, we're working at the back of the ambulance. It was a cold morning. Um, this, this woman still, I don't think, I don't know. She didn't, she didn't make a noise. And uh, we put the baby down on the back of the stretcher. I, I was doing CPR. My partner was uh, doing ventilations. Still no mica. Uh, we did that about four times. Pick, pick the baby up, rub its back, put it down, more CPR. Uh, and then just magically, and thank God, because, you know, there was nothing else we could do, um, but the baby started to colour up and pick up, and then it started to cry. And so we wrapped it up in a blanket, because you've got to get it to the, um, you know, the women's warm. They don't like cold babies. Um, and just as I was handing the baby to mum, the side door of the ambulance opened. It's the mica guy, and the baby's crying. He goes, oh, that's great. And he shuts the door, and he... <laughs> And he drove us to um, the whole sort of two minutes to Box Hill Hospital. So, so that was a nice win. And I was a bit concerned about the downtime of the baby, but the nurses said, look, if they felt that there was any... Like, I was filling out the paperwork, took the paperwork back about an hour later. And I said, look, how's the bub doing? And they, and they said, look, if, if there were any issues, it would have been in ICU, but it wasn't. It was with mum. So no happy fun. days. Yeah. Yeah.
Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Uh, excuse me, I'd just like to make a comment that's relevant to your uh, profession. Uh, and I speak as a doctor who has worked in emergency departments for six years and been a director of one for some time. We realise that the emergency departments around the city of the big city hospitals get blocked up. It's there's continuous complaints about this. Now what happens, the system is that a patient comes into the emergency department, if there's something relatively minor wrong with them, they can get fixed up straight away and they get sent off. The more serious ones, such as those brought in by ambulance, they are assessed by a doctor in the emergency department and the decision is made that they may need admission they may need admission. The decision to admit them is not made in the emergency department. The senior resident doctor of the appropriate specialty is contacted and said and told, there's a patient here for you to assess who may need admission. Now those senior resident doctors are usually flat out in the wards and are not free till something after five o'clock. So the patient can wait all day in the emergency department awaiting further assessment to decide whether they need admission or not. So somebody may come in and be brought in at 10 o'clock in the morning and not be seen till 6 o'clock and the admission decision is not made till then. Now that is the system that blocks up the emergency departments which I found very difficult to deal with, I might say. Mm. Yeah, and I think that I, I think the, the doctors in that position are, are working just as much, if not more, overtime um, than paramedics. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, that, and something needs to be done. We're, we've been waiting too long. Yeah. Thank you. Well said. Um, yes. um, thank you for your insights into Ambulance Victoria and the approaches and challenges they face. The amount of questions you've got is a good indication. <laughs> the amount of questions you've got is a good indication of the level of interest, and so you really hit the mark. Congratulations oh, um, on it, and on behalf of everyone here, I can assure you um, we greatly appreciate your efforts, Absolutely. and and we um, thank you again for sharing your experience in that role. Today. It's a pleasure. Yeah, well, thank well. you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Oh, small take of oh you're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you don't want me to go home with it. Do you? Thank you. Good on Thanks very much. Okay, um, thanks everybody. Well, that just about uh, concludes our, uh, <clears throat> our meeting for this morning. I uh, invite everybody to, uh, those who are staying around, to have some lunch and lunch. But just um, thank uh, the speaker, this Joe. Thanks very much. It was uh, terrific to hear your presentation this morning and uh, what an interesting, varied uh, career you have. You've travelled the world. Uh, if you've uh, done on someone else's money, uh, we, can, we can learn a bit of that as well. But we look forward to. Uh, perhaps you as a guest speaker at some stage when you can bring some uh, photographs of photography and such and where you're burned, particularly in Africa, we, I think we really enjoy that, that'd be terrific, so I look forward to that. And uh, Bronwyn, um, thank you again so much for your presentation, I think um, it's a terrific insight, uh, just um, brings home to me the importance of being nice to paramedics, <laughs> I might need it one day. Um, but the, seriously, the important work that you do do is, uh, is marvellous and uh, thank you for taking the time today. I know it's not a work day for you today, but to be here with us has been tremendously important. I think, um, although I've only been in progress a bit over a couple of years, I think, um, as Mick said, the amount of questions, uh, question time almost probably went as long as your presentation, so such is a level of interest amongst uh, the people here today. So thank you once again. So uh, with that, we'll close the meeting. I invite everybody to stay around for lunch and uh, get a fellowship. Thank you. Well done, John. Thank you.